want all of you to imagine that you have just invested all your money in the stock market. Now, close your eyes, close your eyes, and imagine that all your stocks went like this. <whistles> Open your eyes. Now, raise your hands if you felt that you have lost money. Raise your hands if you felt that you have won money. Why? Why most of us felt that we have won money? The typical answer I get when I make this question is that sounds higher than But what do we mean by higher? Higher where? I'm fascinated by how we create meaning. I think that understanding how meanings emerge is not only fascinating, it can also be very powerful. I just wished I had been taught this at school. This is why, five years ago, I decided to infiltrate myself in different schools and universities and share what I believe to be some of the most exciting findings in the cognitive sciences. My favorite being how we create meaning. And sometimes I will walk into the class and start whistling and ask, why do you think that was a good investment? And indeed, for most of us, it does sound higher than And part of the reason we feel this way is because of the shape of this part of our outer ear. This part makes, makes us feel that sounds higher than When sounds come from above us, it makes us feel that it has a higher pitch. And therefore, we feel that... But there is more to it. Why do we feel that up means more money? This one is straightforward. You take a cup, of water, a cup, you pour in water. The more water you put, the water goes up. In fact, we associate many meanings to up and down. When we were up, we were happy, we were strong, we were virtuous. And when we were down, well, we are all being down. We owe all these associations to gravity. Because we live in this world, in order to go up, in order to climb, we have to fight gravity. When we up, when we manage to be very up, it's because we are very strong, because we have defeated gravity. But what if we didn't have gravity? Then, of course, we wouldn't have up and down. And so, concepts such as hierarchy, well, how would we think about hierarchy if we wouldn't have the experience of having anything above or below us? So, bye-bye the concept of hierarchy. We will have to think of it, about it differently. And, of course, without gravity, we wouldn't have weight. And without weight, what would this weight balance be useful for? Not much. But if you think of it, when we think about justice, we typically do so in terms of equilibrium and balance. So if we didn't have the experience of equilibrium and balance, how would we think about justice? Now, this doesn't mean that without gravity there wouldn't be any justice. What it means is that we will have to think about it differently. And what about basic or fundamental? Well, you can forget about having a stable basis on which to build things, or a foundation for that matter. So bye-bye basic and bye-bye fundamental. You can still use other concepts as, such as essential. So the emerging picture that we have here is that our meanings emerge out of the interaction of our body with the world. From the very basic, the most sophisticated concept, such as justice. But it's important to understand that this equation is anything but deterministic. It's quite the opposite. Remember your investment? Well, in the Pele language spoken in Liberia, they don't say high and low pitch, they say big and small. And it makes sense, just you have to feel it. Okay, so how did your investment go? 
up or did it shrink? Another term worth exploring is time. Time is an abstract concept because we cannot experience it directly with our senses. So in order to think about time, we have to make it tangible. And one of the many ways we make it tangible is to think about the straight line where we organize the past behind us and the future in front of us. And we typically walk toward the future unless we have a deadline and then it's the future that comes hunting us. But we can think about it differently. It is the events that took place in the past that we can contemplate. And the future, the future is always out of sight. And this is precisely what the Aymara community that lives in South America does. When they talk about their past, they point out the future. And when they talk about their future, they point towards their back. And now, just a thought experiment. What would happen if all of us would have also eyes in the back of our heads? Would that affect our notion of back and front? And would that affect our notion of past and future? And wait, there's still more ways to organize past and future. Every morning, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And indeed, some researchers found that a community in Australia organizes time in those terms, past for the east and future for the west. So whatever way we want to think about time, we will do so in terms of our body interacting with the world. We create meaning in order to make sense of the world around us. More precisely, we create meaning to make sense of the things that matter to us. Some of the things that matter to us are tangible, and some are intangible. For the things that are tangible, for the things that you can point with your fingers, it's pretty easy. I mean, this is my shoe, this is my hand, this is my mouth. But, but in order to think about those things that are intangible, the things that are invisible to our senses, in order to bring them back into our life, bring them into our life, we must first give them a shape. It is only then that you can say, hey, look, this is justice, this is time, there was my past, and here comes the future. What this means is that even the most sophisticated and more abstract concepts that populate our mind are shaped by the very physicality of our body. And thus the words, of the physician and educator, Maria Montessori. Give nothing to the mind until you first give it to the hand. It is with and through our body that we create meanings. But if our body has such an important role in meaning creation, how is it that we don't notice it? Let's do another experiment. Touch the shoulder of, a pers of this person who's sitting on your left. Okay, what have you felt? Their shoulder or your hand? When we touch, when we smell, when we see, when we hear, when we taste, we hardly ever pay attention to our body. We hardly ever pay attention to our body in order to focus on the world. So much so that it takes conscious effort to focus on our body and not on the world, because our body is continuously doing tricks on us in order to keep our body hidden in the background and bring in the environment. When we draw on a piece of paper, we typically don't perceive our fingers. What we perceive is the texture of the paper we're drawing on. This is because our body isn't interested in itself. And it isn't interested in the raw senses that it touches of the world. Our body is always reaching out for meaning. And in so doing, our body hides itself to give us the world as a gift. But with this gift comes a confusion. Because our body is so good at hiding itself, we have this very clear feeling that meanings are out there in the world. But without a body, there can't be meaning. Of course, this doesn't mean that without a body, reality vanishes. 
What fades away is our meanings. One of my main goals as a teacher is to help students appreciate the value of our body in the creation of meanings. Because once we bring in our body into the equation, we move from a static world of objects into a dynamic world of relationships. Let me give you a flavor of what could happen in a classroom. So this is from a workshop I was doing in Israel. And one of the students felt that it was unfair that on Saturday there wasn't public transportation. She was not driven by any religious or political issue, uh, motive. As an environmental designer, her focus was merely practical. But no practical ideas came to her mind. She had no project yet. So what we did is start from the very basics. Our bodies in space. And the first intuition was, let's stretch the distance, let's exaggerate the distance to express this feeling that on Saturday things felt further apart. But we are not machines. For us, different distances means very different things, especially when we have to walk those distances. And given a given distance, whether actual or imagined, it just becomes too difficult for us. And one of the many metaphors we use for thinking about difficulty is a steep slope that we have to climb. So the emerging picture that appears on the blackboard was that on Saturday, we might feel inside containers. There's nothing wrong about being inside containers. I mean, most of us live happily in a container. I mean, we call it home. This is when we started speculating that probably hundreds of years ago, most of us were living near our beloved ones. So it's to be once a week close to our friends and family. Sounds pretty good. But if you move in time, most of us in cities don't live next to our friends and family. So once a week to be in a container may promote a sense of isolation. And just then, with this new insight, she had the project to develop. How to promote the sense of community using Saturday. Our body has many ways of engaging with the world around us. For every new interaction we have with the world, it's an opportunity for seeing things from a new perspective. For every metaphor that we recruit, it's a new way of seeing, of understanding the world. Some of the insights from cognitive sciences I have just shared with you today have been around for over 40 years. Yet, this nature, this poetic nature of our mind, is so very often overshadowed by the power of logic and rationality. But, if we want to go beyond the manipulation of the symbols that we have created, if we want to dive into their meanings, if we want to dive into our meanings, we can keep ignoring our body and we can't undermine the value of poetry. Thank you.